Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to UC Berkeley and the 11th annual ASUC Perspective Showcase. Tonight's performance will run approximately two hours and 15 minutes with a 15 minute intermission. We ask that you take this time to notice your nearest emergency exit and turn off all electronic devices. In the event of an emergency, we ask that you calmly exit the theater. Now sit back, relax, and tune into the world. Welcome to Perspectives. Student rallies at the University of California at Berkeley over the past two months have become commonplace. But today's rally in front of Sproul Hall has taken on a different tone. Several thousand students have gathered for what has been billed as a victory celebration, a victory the students feel is assured as a result of yesterday's action by the Academic Senate. That modern man suffers from a kind of poverty of the spirit We've learned to fly the air like birds. We've learned to swim the seas like fish. And yet we haven't learned to walk the earth as brothers and sisters. From the Civil Rights Act of 1964, we began to act as one to spark social change. Cal has a very long story history of what it means to have space for all people. Digging all the way back to when we talked about the free speech movement back to what it was really about. How do I make sure that my voice gets heard and understood as other folks' voices get heard and understood? Since the time of the Vietnam War, and more specifically, the drafting of the Vietnam War, students have been really adamant being able to express their own opinions and their own perspective. If this is a firm, and if the Board of Regents or the Board of Directors even today, we continue the legacy of the men and women who redefine social and political boundaries by echoing their calls for representation, transparency, and equality. The students at the University of California have always strived to give the world a new perspective. There was a tremendous sense of community. It's as if all these students had been waiting to get together and work together, and suddenly they did it. The Perspective Showcase is a collaboration of over 150 performers on this campus. The Perspectives is uh, arguably one of the largest multicultural showcases here at Berkeley and in the West Coast. This is a great way for once a year to sort of put on display all of the incredible diversity and culture we have here so that students remember and recognize that this is also another beautiful aspect of the Cal's community. They're part of performing groups, whether it's acapella, musical theater, dance, comedy, all different sorts of performers from different performing styles, backgrounds and cultures coming together to cross those cultural boundaries and performance style boundaries and work together to create a night of unforgettable informants. But when we're talking about a showcase on a, such a large magnitude as this, it's really important that we go back to the basic framework and ask ourselves, what is diversity? Diversity for me, um, really is about bringing my full authentic self and engaging others as they bring their full authentic self. And everyone here has their own story to tell and everyone here is truly a unique individual coming from their own life. It's diverse. <laughs> I've watched diversity really grow and grow and grow here in Cal. It's, it's completely amazing now compared to what it was 30 some years ago. It allows for differences beyond ethnicity and issues of religion. It talks about class, it talks about gender, it talks about sexuality, it talks about ability. It's both the differences and the commonalities that you celebrate. Diversity is really a combination of multiple layers of difference. It's not just pulling two categories together. The diversity is kind of the result of equity and inclusion. So diversity is not the goal in itself, what you have is you have a diverse community and you want equity and inclusion in that community and that will automatically produce diversity. But I think the problem is that not necessarily we're ignorant individuals, but we're ignorant in the ways we approach looking at diversity. You walk on campus, you don't see a strong people, preponderance of you know, a particular group, uh, and especially not the traditional group uh, on campus. Uh, and yet, 
when you go to social events and so on, you may see that, that uh, people are mostly in one group or another. I think it's much easier to just stay in your comfort zone and be with people who are like you all the time and like-minded individuals. And As the country gets more and more diversified, if you have fields which aren't being diversified, they put themselves in increasing danger of becoming uh, irrelevant or, or not, not well, uh, not competitive with the rest of the world, which may be not having these barriers. This is by far the hardest place I've ever worked. The, the rich diversity of our campus calls upon skill sets that are not required if you live in a more homogenous environment. Well, I think a lot of times people just feel uncomfortable and don't want to step out of their comfort zone, but when you do that, that's when you're truly learning and truly understanding and promoting diversity. By yourself, that diversity is not a concept that makes sense. <laughs> so it's, it's all about uh, who, you know, who's around uh, and working with each other. The way to, to counteract this is definitely to promote exposure, to promote diversity through celebrating diversity. For me, it's it's fun to just walk outside and talk to a student because everyone here has their own story, and they all, we all come from such different and diverse backgrounds, and it's really easy to engage. Cal has definitely opened my eyes to not just going one way, even though I may not believe that way or whatever diverse experience they may have, um, to you know accept it and respect it form opinions and then go out and debate them and talk to other people and I think that's the best way to engage in diversity while you're here. We live in a world full of so many diverse, interesting, unique people. We have people with stories about coming from another country. We have people with stories about having nothing and then being able to come to one of the top universities in the world. And so ignoring all of that is really a missed opportunity to engage in the world. The trick here is to foster the opportunities for for people with differences to come together and you know overcome that sort of natural inclination to, to go with the familiar and take advantage of the opportunity that having all these other people around uh, presents. Uh, you can see diversity and know that it's there, but you don't truly understand diversity until you are able to collaborate and work with other individuals and take it to the next level. So The sharing is, I think, uh, the most exciting part of life. If you just draw circles that touch each other, people think that's collaboration. That is not collaboration. Collaboration is when those circles overlap. And that where they overlap, something new is created. Success as an institution comes from collaboration. Comes from talking to the person next to you in class that you don't normally talk to. Comes from taking a flyer from somebody on Sproul, not as an easy way to get out of the situation, but it's an opportunity to learn about events that are coming up that you might not normally attend. And what's unique about collaboration is it brings out these different elements that are unique from one another um, that you know we may not have even, even ever seen. To really make it live for each, each of us, we have to, to live. So it has to be in our lives and our lives. It's what's exciting is that meeting new people, hearing and, and engaging and creating something with them. Perspectives is not only just collaborative performances. It's art students who contributed 150 pieces about their identities. It's a guest speaker, Professor Victoria Robinson, who's going to be talking about what collaboration really means and the difficult work that has to be done to make it a successful process. And it's over 15 filmmakers who went out into the campus to bring us what their perspective is of Cal, to show us what Cal really means to them. To the 2,000 people in Zeller Rock Hall, or some of that that you came to the show, and I hope that this spurs you to think about critical questions of not just who you are, but how you will engage other people that are both like you and different. The folks who will come to this will be uh, the potential movers and shakers uh, to move this, this agenda forward. Tonight is a break from the race from A to B. It's the culmination of over eight months of collaborative work. It's the chance as individuals and as a community to learn how we can be more inclusive. This is a chance to explore your perspective. Welcome to Perspectives. I hate labels. I hate that society shoves us into countless little boxes, 
one for each of our defining characteristics, separating us from one another and keeping us from seeing what the other boxes are like. I hate that as I try to tiptoe out of the closet and be honest with something I've been struggling with for several years now, I have to first figure out what box I belong in. I hate that because one of my boxes bears a label reading middle class, everyone is astonished to find out that I'm paying for my education almost entirely with private loans in my name because I don't qualify for financial aid and my parents don't have five spare dollars to contribute. I'm ready to leave these boxes behind and I can't wait for the day when everyone else is too.
I awake to the sound of my phone's heartbeat, heartbeat buzzing a text message pulse into lifeless veins, convulsing me from sleep like an electric chair. I, I roll, roll over, over, feel bones snap into place, stumble from house in a sleep-deprived daze, eyes glazed over last night's crazed feasting on problem sets, 12 chapters of Italian, squeezing 500 pages of Takaki into four hours, bullshitting 16 weeks of Foucault and dependency theory just to pass today's test. <laughs> We, we are, are the living, living dead, cow zombies that only want grains. Today, I cement headphones into ear canal like maggots, eating away the dead flesh of sleep. Thirst for caffeine like an elixir to lift the grave from my chest because double shot espresso blood hammering out a pulse to rolling in the deep. 
are the only things keeping my limbs moving this, this morning. morning. I am five minutes past Berkeley time late to class. Save starving babies with AIDS in Africa. Snatch. Free cupcakes on Friday. Snatch. Defend the environment, it only takes five minutes of your Snatch. I navigate my minutes with the surgeon's precision, but with these headphones, I am bothered by no bleeding hearts. Instead, I am a ghost floating through your flyers. Do not talk to me. I am busy watching birds, counting clouds, dodging cracks in the pavement, looking anywhere but at, at you. you. Alive in another world, my headphones block out the threat of coming to life, make me feel home in a crowd of strangers. Conductor of silent symphonies on mute, the world becomes my own graveyard to waltz through. Don't try to reach out to me, there is no heart Heartbeat here. Talk and I'll let out a no. no. Thank you. Keep walking forward, always forward, never stopping. We, we are, are not alone. alone. Some nights the library looks like a haunted mansion. We bury ourselves under books and dig ourselves out every morning, souls trapped between textbook covers. In the daylight, our bones crack into unanswered hellos, dropped flyers, no thank yous, one way smiles. We, we are two ghosts passing in the street. Busy to acknowledge each other's humanity. See dumbass kids spasming to music next to Bart entrance. Sunken eyed woman bothering me for drug money. We, we do, do not, not care, care about low minority enrollment. Gender neutral bathrooms. Safe prayer space. DSP ramps and elevators to classrooms. Protesters' ribs cracked on sprawl steps. Broken families shooting each other five miles outside a campus. These, These are, are not, not our problems. problems. These, These are, are not, not supposed to be our problems. problems. We just keep walking. Hungry for the next meal. Dragging our decaying bones to the the same mechanical pulse. Telling ourselves our hearts stopped beating too long ago to care. Father and 
December 2nd, 1964. Student activists stood on the steps of Sproul Hall to protest UC Berkeley's ban of on-campus political activities. They were angry, fed up with a nation that didn't care about blacks, and an administration that wouldn't let them talk about it. There's a time when the operation of the machine becomes so odious, makes you so sick at heart, that you can't take part, you can't even passively take part. And you've got to put your bodies upon the gears and upon the wheels, upon the levers, upon all the apparatus, and you've got to make it stop. The protesters occupied the building and were met with opposition from the police, resulting in what was then the largest mass arrest in California. But the fury of the student body was too much to handle, and by 1965, the new chancellor established a middle ground and embraced student demands for free speech. Generations that followed could voice their opinions on campus. On September 27, 2011, the Berkeley College Republicans held an increased diversity bake sale in Sproul Plaza. The bake sale addressed the issue of affirmative action and the then pending legislation SB 185 that would have allowed colleges to take into consideration factors like race and gender in student admission. Many students deemed the bake sale as a racist and overly simplified take on affirmative action. While they criticized the methods through which the Republicans voiced their opinions, how else could the Republicans have been heard? Could they have gone out to a street corner, held signs, and vocalized their opinions? Would anyone have paid attention? In a school where picket signs, flyers, and petitions are commonplace, where free speech is exercised regularly, how do you make your voice stand out among the rest? On top of that, how do you deal with an administration that openly opposes your point of view? UC Berkeley over the years has developed an image of being a liberal campus. Students with leftist ideology can have their voices amplified by the community at large and opposing opinions are seen as disturbing the political status quo that's been maintained for decades. Before the Republicans held their bake sale, Chancellor Bergino wrote an open letter to the campus community criticizing the event. The student government body, ASUC, 
held an emergency meeting and considered cutting funding for the club. The bake sale was also met with opposition from a multicultural student coalition that excluded the Berkeley College Republicans from a meeting to discuss the implications of the event. These and other acts of opposition from the student body highlight the struggles Republicans faced on a biased campus. This begs the question, does everyone at Cal have a right to free speech? At the moment, we're uninterested in examining whether affirmative action is right or wrong, or whether the Berkeley Republicans are right or wrong. The Bake Sale generated far greater discussion and awareness of affirmative action and diversity on campus. It brought people together to talk about key issues and demonstrated the importance of free speech and dialogue between groups. When we came to Berkeley, we expected an environment in which we could exchange opinions, expose ourselves to new ideas, and reevaluate ourselves. We're fortunate to be at a school like Cal, where the community is not only diverse, but also full of visionaries. People here idealize a better world and strive to make it a reality. But what good is it if ideas are only shared with a select few and if certain groups of the community are discouraged from voicing their opinion? Interaction, collaboration, and even disagreement can inspire informed discussions that give students the confidence to take thoughtful action. The debates also provide the larger community something to reflect upon when considering important issues like affirmative action. Campus-wide dialogue shouldn't depend on cupcakes, and Republicans shouldn't be criticized for trying to foster it.
But if you're right, he was just another nice guy. What if you're right? What if it's true? They say the cross will only make a fool of you. What if it's true? What if he takes a place in history with all the prophets and the kings who taught us love and came in peace? But then the story ends. What then? But what if you're Dying. It's, it's time to lend a hand to life, the greatest gift of all. We can't go on pretending day by day that someone somehow will soon make a change. We are all a part of God's great big family and the truth you know love is all we need we are the world we are the children we are the ones 
to make a brighter day, so let's start giving. These are not supposed to be our problems. These, These are, are not, not supposed to be our problems. problems. These, These are, are not supposed to be our problems. problems. I see my sunken eyes reflected in the sockets of those around me. Eyeballs the depth of graves, buried away from asking palms, pumping with fresh blood, trying to pull me from my comfortable drudge. We, we are, are a together. together. Crutches for each other's crunching limbs. It makes it easier not to look at something that everyone turns a blind eye to. The mechanical monsters behind me are my walking excuses to follow suit and crumple my fingers into arthritic claws about my headphones. I bury my ears deep beneath the sound of my familiar path, my soundtrack on repeat. It guides my strides, my strokes, and keeps me straight like staff lines on a music score. I can even close my eyes when I walk because I can see everything I need to with my, my headphones here. My surround sound guiding my surroundings to the reality my music paints for me. Repeating, repeating like a parrot on a perch only knows one word. Rewind, replay, does a caged bird know monotony? I would never want to break out of this body. Thin flesh stretched across bones bent like caged bars. The same songs reverberating between ears sealed shut. It doesn't sound like monotony. It just feels like home. And when I focus on the rhythm, I can feel myself becoming translucent. I tell myself they won't see me. They won't see me. See, this complacency is a cold casualty of the viral pathologies within me, about me, around me, wrapped up in me so well. I'm too heavy to be breathable. I mean, it's inconceivable stepping out into cold world without first rolling those eyeballs in, melting socket to melded skin, pinning face closed for fear of being exposed to that cacophonous flying apocalypse outside of my tidy self sarcophagus. I fight against eye contact and outreached hands like blizzard blasts, but there are too many stubborn mouths moving, spinning winds of words in my direction, faceless bodies and voices, flyers scattered by the wind like jigsaw pieces, but I don't know a picture to place them in, how to fit them, connect them. Sometimes, Sometimes I wonder if they would fit, fit the, the right, right way. way. Would, would they, they sound, sound like, like a, a symphony, symphony together? together? But the loop of my soundtrack has no room for new tunes, no room for chance of diversity and equality and unison. From bodies blocking my path to a bake sale. What could be so important about cupcake prices? 
Never mind. mind. I don't want to know what this gathered chorus of confusion is orchestrating, parading I, through Sproul. I don't want to get mixed up in this. I can't seem to walk through them. So I step over them and scan the sky. Anything then to meet those protesting eyes. Fresh like flowering spring. Iris is showering an air of curiosity makes ignoring the outside world near impossible. Piercing pupils bursting with enough life to resuscitate me. They burn my dead skin from the surface. I try to protect myself from their grating gazes and bury my mind, muffle the, the ice scratches of their voices, digging to uproot me from the warm soil of my songs. My earbuds must have some place to grow. They're the only parts of me that still feel alive. I see other zombies begin to stare at the bake sale, begin to notice the protests. They stop their, in their stagger in their tracks and glance at their skin, peeling back pallid, clammy flesh to reveal shades of humanity. Tiny, Tiny notes and tinctures of a forgotten mutuality. I, I see them, I see, see them. them. Pull an earbud from the side of their head, hard like it is caught on something. Roots and stray dirt spill from ears. Pupils bloom to take in something that is bigger than themselves. They shrug their shoulders, shrugging off knots from hunchback library dungeons, snap their elbows back, cracking them into motion again to reach out for a flyer. They Pry their jaws open, coughing the dust from their lungs to ask a question. Life on the margins, blossom from shriveled paper legions to real breathing persons, passions, reasons, and missions. Missing me, seeds deflected by my season, suspicions, those deep-rooted notions keeping me from growing. Fine, Fine. I, I do, do not, not need, need them. them. I will walk alone because... I think I'd rather be through... Proxy. Because my self-screen processes of my seeing you and you seeing me make the thought of a... We. we too overwhelming. Too much, I'm too deadened to see lives of those around me beyond these safe distancing screens, if, if only. only. The protest charges on. Chants of affirmation even louder than zombie moans drowning out most of the voices behind the bake sale. I see color in faces of different colors rise in reaction to signs that tell them that color is a defacement. But I wonder, what is the color of limbs too colorless to be human? I check to make sure my headphones are still in tight, but one has slipped just ever so slightly, earbud balancing on the edge of the lobe, a single pedal pushing its way through. I pull the pedal out. Try to push it back in, but it won't fit the same. And surrounding, and surrounding noises, noises have started, started leaking, leaking in. in. I'm sorry. It's okay, I'll just wait for you to come down. One. Still can't believe you made me walk all the way to Unit 2. Sorry, I've been pledging, so I was busy. That's my bad. Well, I know you want to be an RA, so I picked up some medication for you. Ooh, thank you. By the way, I got the R position. Nice! Oh my gosh, oh. congratulations! Thank you. Yeah, I gotta go, but I'll see you later. Just okay. out. Sounds good. So, I mean, a lot of clubs, like, you joining a lot of clubs definitely helps, and they always do, like, social events, like, they'll uh, hike up to the big sea, like, go to the Campanile. So, there's a lot of different ways that you can do it. But personally, I met my best friend here in this elevator, so, you know, sometimes don't ignore people who are in the elevator with you, I guess. Hey, sixth floor. If you guys want dinner, let's go. Get in the elevator. Hey, Ben. 
That was up. You're graduating soon, right? Did you do everything you wanted to here at Cal? I mean, I, kind of. I would just say, like, cherish every moment and take every opportunity that you can possibly get. I wish I had four more years so I could do the things that I didn't get a chance to do. I'm off to my first interview. I'm really excited. I'm also really nervous. Don't worry, you'll be fine. Remember how you helped me with my laundry in first year? Oh, yeah, that was a long time ago. Yeah, I do. Just be super friendly like that, and I'll love you. <laughs> You'll do great. Thank you so much. I don't even know what I would do without you in my life. It's just crazy. I'm sorry! It's okay, I'll just wait for you going down. Damn. Hey, Jack.
you, no one will ever hold you back. So look into my eyes and just dance. You know what? Maybe I'll take a chance. After all, he is the Phantom of the Opera.
every day as I get out of my car and head towards class, I get funny stares. The surprised look on people's faces upon seeing a non-wheelchair person parking in a handicapped spot is a regular occurrence. I have a heart and muscles condition which limits my mobility. It's not so apparent if you were to see me walking down the street, but after being with me for 10 minutes, you would notice my limitations. Yet, I'm not considered handicapped to the average bystander. Sometimes I feel that I have to be so disabled, mentally and or physically, for someone to accommodate me. I wish people would realize that disabilities aren't so black and white. There are 10 million shades of gray in between. It comes in all shapes and forms. I force myself to pronounce words the American way, even though it kills me. I'm an international student, and yeah, sometimes I, I miss my friends or my family, but nothing compares to the sheer awkwardness and uh, annoyance that I feel when subjected to these comments or questions. You're international? I never would have guessed. I'm still not exactly sure what this is supposed to imply. Does living overseas mean that you grow a pair of antlers or turn your skin green or have some other characteristic consequences that you can spot from a mile away? Oh my god, you have an accent. <laughs> this one takes the cake. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I do. Cool story. The shocker, so do you. <laughs> You're, uh... You're international, but your English is, is so good. Well, yeah. So what? Why are the two mutually exclusive? My English is probably just as good as yours, considering I use British spelling, pronunciation, and grammar. But I started switching to American English just to avoid this conversation. I, I still actually haven't formulated a response. I just sort of stand there awkwardly and, and smile and nod and wait to evaporate every time this happens. What did I do? Did I fail as a mother? Silence endured on my side of the conversation. If this problem you created causes your father and me to divorce, I will no longer consider you my daughter. Her words shattered in my head. It was at this point that I realized that being gay meant destroying the very foundation on which I was raised and I didn't have the strength to do it. I told her I was wrong, I wasn't gay, it was just a phase. That was two years ago. Today, I am different. I won't try to make you believe I no longer care about how coming out will affect my family, but I know now that I don't deserve to feel ashamed. The risk feels immense, but the final reward, the love I will feel for myself is completely worth the fear. And I'll be here, Mom, waiting for you on the other side. I'm a black student. I just study here. Fields and courts, I don't come near. Sports was the thing I wasn't good at, but my body says the opposite. What's up with that? I'm not the one you see at the game. Backs of shirts have their last name. I'm not that poster child, walk into Haas and drive the crowd wild. Yes, we may look alike due to my complexion. An athlete's story is different from mine. They use their bodies, but I, my mind. Yet people somehow come up to me asking, are you an athlete? Why is that idea so magnetic? Thanks a lot, Cal Athletics. <laughs> an athlete story, equally beautiful. Educating about racial profiling, that would be useful. Triple doubles and layups are not for me. I'm just a student, can't you see? And then there's that word, handicapped. I've come to detest the student, word. But Look it up so and at the I'd like source. to tell her that I don't care what she thinks. Appear. I'm a black student. I'd like to tell her that this is me and if she can't accept that woman, she can't get the hell out of my life. I will give it down. I am not the one who's there is no respect in our relationship. But in no way do I appear to be some other red nether politician. As soon as these words of protest.
My goodness. Okay, so Harry Legrand, Vice Chancellor, suggested I beatbox first. <laughs> That's as good as it gets. <laughs> the last time I was this scared, I was in the labor room without any um, painkillers. <laughs> so you can imagine the, how terrified I feel. And then Jason says, just imagine it's uh, Dwinell, it's fine. It's not fine, I can't see a damn thing. <laughs> so, you know, the, the work that we do here on campus around the questions of diversity are so complex, so multifaceted, so multivocal that not one person on the faculty or student or staff or community member could really summarize, I think, the challenges and the possibilities of this work. You can, you can see how nervous I am. I wanted those security blankets of lecture notes and PowerPoints. And Jason says, no, you've just got to riff it, okay? So I wanted to really share with you just one statement or sentiment from a fellow faculty member who unfortunately is no longer with us. It's a professor of history, Lawrence Levine. Lawrence Levine said, we can't understand the country if we don't understand the country. The only way... <laughs> That's not my kind of understanding. <clears throat> the only way to understand the country and to imagine it is through diversity. Diversity is not the barrier to being American. Diversity is the answer to Americanness. It's the only way. Now, I think what Professor Levine was telling us to try to, to achieve, to work towards, is imagining the sharp edges and the difficult tensions, the histories of violence as well as the histories of possibilities, the lands taken from indigenous peoples, the conquest, the settlements, the kinds of immigration, nativism that we've experienced. Those are all complex, really difficult conversations to have. And we feel, I think, some of that work coming through tonight that we are celebrating the cultural performances of what culture means to us as a nation, as a concept, as a theory, as a lived space. But we're also imagining the ways in which politically, socially, economically, demographically, it falls out for us in an everyday way. Toni Morrison said, imagine the places that aren't filled. Think about the absences as much as the presences. And I think that political work is something that we suggest that this campus does not think of as outside its, its vision. It's absolutely central in the way in which we imagine the future for our university. Now, what does that work look like? Well, again, it's, it's not for one person to say or do this work in the moment, and I want to take us back 50 years. So if we could cue the music. This is where the music's supposed to come in. famous John Coltrane, right? And borrowing, yay, right? <laughs> borrowing from what? Something that is so familiar in the American psyche in 1959, 
with the sound of music, and these are a few of our favorite things. The idea of fleeing from Nazis and the idea of a particular piece of European history. And John, John Coltrane, who himself had moved from North Carolina to Philadelphia, is making the imagination of what to do with that piece of music to engage a diverse audience. Now he starts with the familiar, but that piece that we listened into, all of a sudden there's the alto sax, there's two pianos, there's a number of different players, right, going on along with, with John Coltrane, and each of them's having to do several very important things. They're having to listen, they're having to trust, and they're also having to think about respect. Jazz is a metaphor for the ways in which one person can think of that dissonance, that unstructured idea of where we might go as a cacophony, as noise, as too complex, too fraught with tensions and anxieties. The idea of not being dictated to by one person's story, of being multivocal. And yet, what Coltrane's work and music allows us to imagine is the possibilities of possibilities when we trust each other enough to think that the differences could be something that we could listen to and we could build from. There's an arc running through that piece of John Coltrane where it's always moving back to, these are a few of our favorite things, but everybody moves away for a while and then they come back together. And by the end of the piece, it is bigger, it is better, it is more complex, it is a richer story. And that to me is really metaphorically what the tensions and the possibilities, the anxieties and the beauty is that our campus faces today. We're full of cleavages, but there's a lot of churning. And that churning should be seen by us, the faculty, the staff, our community, our students, as not one that we walk away from. The churning is full of possibilities. So this is supposed to be brief, Jason, I promise. And so ending on this kind of, I'm not one for poetry. Those of you who know me from my classes, I'm not, I'm not really a poet. More than anything, you know, I'm a kind of a cocktail person. I like to. <laughs> I know, I've made tons of gin and tonic jokes in my classes. <sighs> Those are the clean jokes, <clears throat> so. <laughs> yeah, uh, sorry. Yeah, sorry about that, parents. This is a Berkeley education. <laughs> but the moment that we're faced with, and this is the beauty of this event tonight, which I'm, I said this to Jason before, I hope this doesn't sound proudful, but I am proud, that the moment tonight is full of hubris and humility. And I made up this in the bath last night. <laughs> no dirty jokes in there. But this is the poetry to end on, which is that I've heard that winds can create hurricanes. And tonight, truly, I felt the breeze. Berkeley, our faculty, our students, our staff, our community, because our communities are so much bigger than our university. We're so proud of the work that's been done tonight, and I'm proud that I have the opportunity to work with so many wonderful students for the past 12 years, and hopefully much longer. Congrats tonight. Nice to be with you all. Today, I saw a little boy crumping at the Berkeley BART station. The morning starts with my headphones. My ears never woke up. They're still sleeping to the lullaby of my music. Ding. It rocks the sides of my head back and forth like a baby in a cradle that's shaped like a box. Ding, ding, ding. My earbuds ding. The doors are closing. The BART lady breathes against my eardrums, but I can't hear her. See, I'm listening to a little tune. It goes kind of like this. The head is a box. A top and a bottom and in and out, labeled with the face. A head is a moving box, packed full of memories, handled with care. The head is everything you need to build a house. The head is the house itself. 
The Bart punches through landscapes, through hills that look like zombies, and I don't know what possesses me to take this detour, but I do now. The doors are closing. Behind me, and the first thing I see is a little boy crumping, arms stretching wide in the middle of the station. My, his body cracks open like a seed. My headphones drop like dead branches, and I've sprouted these lips, these eyes I didn't know I had. I thought my head was just a box, but I've got ears and eyes and breath now and hands that can slap beat my chest now. Call it guerrilla radio. The little boy's dance interrupts my lullaby, and I think, if the head is a box, it must be a speaker, and life must be the music a body makes when the world sends out a signal. But down below, I can still hear the tune that has rocked me to sleep so many times, brainwashed radio blaring through my headphones. I can feel its weight on my shoulders, still singing, telling me to leave this boy to his dancing and go back to sleep, back to the cradle. The tune tells me. The head is a box. The head is a boxer. It'll rise and fall and swing back from every punch, a face of resistance in the face of danger, spitting tape and blood and the taste of cardboard even in the final round a champion the core of a human being you're strong you're a fighter don't lose your defense don't let it all come down the head is a house the billboard and headlights of the soul the wall that holds the window the frame that holds the door seven different entrances in one room and room for only one so much inside so seal yourself in with headphones every box needs a lid every house needs a door but the little boy's dance sings a new tune, louder, it says. Every window has a hinge. To swing back and forth. To stretch like arms. Open as echoes. Beats of the body. Sent to the world. Forward and back. Like sound waves. Like cycles. Like, like a, a system. system. The little boy's dance moves like a jungle fire. It blows the lid right off my box. And one day I too will be ready to breathe fire. But, but right, right now, now I'm, I'm just, just watching, watching everything, everything grow. grow. to show up. That's History of Berkeley, final. Let's see you complete this in eight minutes. Oh man, that GSI is such a tool. <laughs> I, I should have spent last night studying, not trying to get that sorority girl's phone number. Curse you, the reject hotline! <laughs> Anyways, we really should get started. Okay. Question one, Berkeley's founding. Describe very briefly how the location for UC Berkeley was chosen. I, I don't have any, I well, okay. So there was, there was a meeting where all the founders got together. Gentlemen, as the trustees of this hmm? fine university to be, I think it's time we've decided on a building site for our school. Any ideas? Many locations were suggested, and many were denied. Finally, finally, a decision was made. Men, I have found the most picturesque site for our school, tastefully tucked away into the rolling foothills over the bay, looking out into the mighty Pacific. It is a land without fault. Billings, you're forgetting the biggest. <laughs> Billings, you're forgetting the biggest fault, the Hayward Fault Line. It's pretty big. Oh, uh, as the proud geologist, uh, I cannot condone building on a seismically and dangerously active area, so no. Shut up, geologist. I'm trying to shake up university education. <laughs> That's a pun. You get it? <laughs> Anyways, it's time to turn our hearts and our minds to a more pressing issue. What do we name this school, this magnificent House of Learning. And at that moment, a basketball rolled towards Billings, reminding him of Bishop Charles Barkley. <laughs> a British, he was a British philosopher and member of the 1993 NBA Western Conference champion Phoenix Suns. Thus, fate dictated that it should be for Barkley that the university was named. But, a mis mistranslation from the British to English language <laughs> gave us the town of Berkeley that we know and love today. <laughs> All right, radical. Done with question one. Okay, question number two. 
describe two major scientific discoveries to come out of Berkeley. Uh, well, it was 1959, and uh, everyone was in lab coats uh, doing, doing science, yeah. Hey Flo, check out the, this element I invented. I call it Lorentzian. Congrats, Lawrence, that's really swell. And in that moment, chemistry was forever changed by Robert Berkeley's raging jealousy. Berkelium was born. Gosh, Flo, that's a nice lab coat. <laughs> Same one you have. <laughs> hey, I hope you're not busy or anything. Actually, I just invented this new element. It's called Berkelium. It's got four protons and four neutrons more than Lorentzium. Did I mention I invented the tater tot? Every day! Well, I just invented this new element, Californium. It's an invisible element. Boom! Tablium! See, you can't just do that. <laughs> oh, yeah? You can't just hit a table. Boom! <laughs> Berkeley's a nerdy. You troglodyte! Stop! Look, you two, I'm not interested in either of you, and no amount of made-up elements is going to change that. Let's just all get back to our work. Can we get back to our work? You're right, Flo. Enough of this science mumbo jumbo. Check out my latest titration. <laughs> the apple tea. That was the cure to polio! This is the cure to the Mondays. <laughs> Moving right along here. Okay, question number three. Explain the circumstances that led to the birth of the Cal Stanford rivalry. Huh. Hey, last cookie! Oh, yes! <laughs> wow! Wow! Classy. It said short answer, that should be long enough. All right, question four, part A. What were the underlying causes of the free speech movement? Oh gosh, uh, okay, well, well here goes. Back in the 60s, speech was not free. <laughs> it, it used to cost a whole dollar back then, which was like 100 back then. Due to inflation, things changed. Students couldn't even afford to give oral presentations. And the most fascinating battle of the Civil War was the... Uh, uh, uh. <gasps> young lovers... <laughs> young lovers could not express their feelings for one another. Helen, I've loved you for so long. I think it's time. Will you marry me? Oh, I... Uh, uh. <laughs> I... I need an answer now before the train leaves in two and a half minutes. Students had no other choice but to resort to interpretive dance. Crap, there's a part B. How did Mario Sa Savio influence the free speech movement? Huh. Mario? Mario? Mario saw how much of an injustice unfree speech was and came to the rescue free just speech in time. For everybody! <laughs> I'm glad I'm alone in here. Okay, that's close enough. Okay, second to last question. 
describe the Occupy Cal movement and its impact on the university. Oh yes, finally, a question that I can answer. <laughs> I was there for the whole thing. I can see it in my mind's eye like a fresh painting. The Occupy movement was a special time in Berkeley history. We were fighting for individual rights for people like you and also me. The man kept talking, but we shut him up with our human microphones. And we took back Plaza for ourselves and made it a camping zone. Occupy movement means staying up all night, eating marshmallows and getting their pillow fights. Braided lanyards was my favorite of all the events. Cozy in my sleeping bag right inside my tent. test. One more question. Okay, what makes Berkeley such a great university? Diversity, of course. A plus! and see any different type of culture or just any different type of person and I just feel like I can be completely totally myself at all times whenever I walk down Sproul. It's got the small town feel but also it's got so many people that you can meet so many different people but at the same time it doesn't have that intensity of a big city. Coming from a smaller town. I come from a small town. Where everyone had pretty much similar uh, perspectives. So I never saw any LGBT community uh, members really. There's such a like clash and um, melting pot. A melting pot of every different kind of person. Mm -hmm. 
I see diversity on campus just based off the excessive amounts of uh, different student organizations that reflect different uh, different groups of people. A relevant part of your grade even comes from what you have to say and what every single person has to say. Like in class, like just hearing people's difference and varying opinions um, in discussion sections is really interesting. If it's right or wrong, as long as you have something different to say from the rest, and that's where you can see this diversity reflected. Being friends that I never would have saw like otherwise. <laughs> to gender and sexuality, I think there's a big diversity in campus. Diversity is important because we live in a very complicated and complex world and there's a lot of different people out there uh, who come from a number of different walks of life and in order to really function in the world, at least it's my personal belief, you have to know how to work with different people. Society makes it so you have a limited perspective in order to understand the world. Society tries to simplify things, and diversity is not simple. Diversity, I, I don't think you can be as um, intelligent and like cultured of a person if you want to say it that way, and that like you really only see one perspective if there's no diversity around you. So I think diversity is incredibly important. I I thought I knew what diversity was uh, before I came to Cal. Like, being at Cal has changed uh, what diversity means to me. Definitely changed my conception of diversity really exposed me to different uh, intellectual diversity, so to speak, so it's given me a lot of new information. I've learned to value more what other people have to say. You're not always going to be right, and you don't always need to be right, as long as you have a voice and you have something to say, and also respect other ways of living. Nigelata, kuch para bigelata, ek aani aayi thi, jab dil se aaj nikli thi, dil se re. Come with me, come with me, and we can run across the sky, illuminate the night, whoa, I will try and guide you to better times and brighter days, don't be afraid to go. And we can let it spread. 
fresh and red. Your freedom in our singing.
I'm learning to unwind, to stop rewinding. I'm learning to rip out my insecurity. My music round my ears, my muscles and stubborn knots taught. I got tired of plugged in umbilical cord, threading static through my earlobes. I am learning again to hear world's murmurs. Unwind like warm honey to deep new drum beats, fall into new dances. For years, I muted the crushing waves of Mao's murmuring silence. Stared at beautiful faces, wondered how sunshine must spill through their voices like a cold glass of milk on easy floors when they speak. But I have never stopped to taste their words. Unwind like warm honey. But there was a day, I think I remember, when I once crumbled conversations into my hug, shushed my stories bare for all of us to lay in. When I stared at forgotten faces of strangers stepping by, when salt ocean tasted like a curl of lights against my lip. When I saw that little boy at the BART station, crumping, body crumpling and uncrumpling like tossed poem, winding and unwinding like breathing flowers, like breathing lung as if to expel his soul, as if to untie it like a flapping balloon and let it loose to hurtle into mine, grab, grab it, it like, like a, a hand, hand and show it how to crook a finger first and how to twitch a toe, how to scatter dirt of underground living and dance. dance. Catch shuffle steps without attempting to reorder, to rewind. No, no matter our dances, dances we, we have the same 639 muscles to unwind, unwind in our, our bodies. bodies. Learn me samba, learn me ballet, turn me tango and teach me dubke, foreign sounds to unroll my body around. My mother's curling tongue, 
always tasted of home, I will walk barefoot through the bamboo soil of her homeland until my arms open back up to you. For years, I, I thought, thought my music was only the slang tilt of my mama's voice and a monolingual reedy twang. Remember, I can never find home digging into my headphones. But in the open-ended kisses to my mother as she crinkles lumpia in the kitchen, learn me warai, learn me familia, teach me makibaka, struggle, kiss the scent of my ancestors and all respect to their words, wrap around my voice. Now ears, free of bed buds, free of electrical umbilical cords, I am learning again to hear new chords. There's a little note of Malacca in your London. Drum beats of alien hearts, a body swaying like towering flowers. A Himalayan range emerges between our shared footsteps. Faces and Palms unwinding skyward, blood beating in wrists. I open a box and you got arms like birthday present bows. We, we dance, dance to car horns bleeding like sheep. Voices raise an alien song. We, we dance, dance to splish splash of dirty dishes. And, and rhythm of working two jobs to pay for school. And endless top ramen. Cocoa, Cocoa puffs. puffs and dance of satin ballet shoes you left in the closet. Dance of single dad come back to study geography. And first generation student. Dance of woman crunching aluminum cans. And carrying them by bus for three miles. Wearing worn out blue sneakers. So she can buy bicycles on scrap for eight kids. We dance your story. Share stories with strangers on buses and three minute interactions the way their lip curls up when I find a story hidden between their chests for too many years we, we dance, dance your stories. stories I will strip the anonymous from my chest find love in the whisper of my name to a new friend cuddle into my hug my arms are as open as sunflowers to sky's blue voice string your voice here into my footsteps and I will walk with you I will build a bridge and let you step with me. With the sweet sweat of my palm, I will grab your hand. And, and we, we will dance, dance your stories. stories. And we will remember what my kiss felt like before I plugged into my insecurities. And we will dance to new songs there's never been bloomed open to before. I hear them from your voice and your piano-worn fingers. We, we dance, dance your stories. Won't, Won't you dance mine? mine? Stop and avalanche as it races down the hill. You can try and stop the seasons, girl, but you know you never will. And you can try to stop my dancing feet, but I just cannot stand still. Cause the world keeps spinning around and around, and my heart keeps charging the speed of sound. I was lost till I heard the jump, and I found my way. Forever 